Hardly any American hasn't heard about the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Begin with this, a major development in the Flint water crisis. Today, Just former Michigan ago. Governor Rick Snyder pleaded not guilty to misdemeanor charges. Flint tap water he was laced with dangerous levels of lead. The state knew about it. This bombshell 2014 story of lead contaminated drinking water dominated media platforms and has since become a heated political topic. Dangerously high lead levels threaten the entire community, from children to pregnant women, causing outrage nationwide. Flint, Michigan is a story of neglect, environmental injustice, and poor precautionary and legislative action from officials. But its premise is a pattern that's all too familiar. As the Flint, Michigan water crisis continues to develop, there's an eerily similar crisis taking place thousands of miles away in the Bay Area. Tonight, tap water in a part of Oakland is getting dangerous to drink, and it's because the amount of lead in the water there is rising. And it's like this is Fruitvale. Fruitvale is a small, largely residential neighborhood with just over 50,000 residents, located about four miles southeast of the more sprawling downtown Oakland. In mainstream media or news, you may know Fruitvale through the 2013 film Fruitvale Station, a nonfiction film covering the fatal shooting of a young man by a police officer at the BART station, or the infamous ghost ship warehouse fire in December of 2016, one of the deadliest fires in Oakland history. Historically, Fruitvale has a rich history brought together on the backs of the civil rights movements in the 1960s through 1990s through activist groups like the Chicano Movement, Black Panthers, and Native American tribes. Fruitvale, like many largely minority communities, faced the blunt impact of the drug war, and for a while, Oakland was one of the homicide capitals of the nation. Despite these challenges, the resilient residents of Fruitvale have largely preserved their culture and prevailed. The streets of Fruitvale are decorated with beautiful murals led by the Chicano art movement, street markets, and mom and pop restaurants. However, like Flint, Fruitvale is having a public crisis due to lead poisoning. While the lead poisoning in Flint can be traced to old lead pipes, Fruitvale's water has a different culprit, paint. Just like an old friend, you can count on and trust. It's like smoking on sunshine. Over 90% of the housing in Oakland was built before the federal lead paint ban of 1978. Lead paint, which is recognized as being highly toxic, remains on the walls, and as it chips away, tiny yet lethal base lead particles are unknowingly inhaled by inhabitants, entering the soil or contaminating water supplies. Driving down the streets of Fruitvale, house after house displays this chipping paint. But while Flint received nationwide coverage, the reports on Fruitvale remain largely silent, and the impacts have been disastrous. There's so little coverage on this issue that some residents of Fruitvale are unaware of the lead poisoning itself. Uh. No, the, the, no, no, because if the painters, eh, they, they work very, very careful, no, no. Si ellos tienen precaución con lo que están haciendo, no, no, no los niños no pueden resultar daño. Eh, muchas casas están pintadas con pintura nueva, sí, muchas casas, no pintura vieja. But how did we get to the point where lead paint was such an issue in Fruitvale? Well, the issue stems back nearly two decades in a massive California lawsuit against paint companies. Now at 530, a major victory for several Bay Area counties in the battle against lead paint. In 2000, Santa Clara County sued five major companies claiming they had sold dangerous lead paint for decades, all while understanding the risks. And what came out in trial was evidence that they knew while they were busy marketing lead paint that it was toxic and harmful to our communities. For too long, paint companies have been able to dodge responsibility for their actions. Victims of lead poisoning face long odds in trying to seek justice even when they were clearly harmed they by knew, lead paint. But then they continued to sell this product and they didn't ban the product. Well, it was forced upon them to ban the product in 1978. Larry Brooks is the director of the Alameda County Healthy Homes Department and has been advocating for lead poisoning prevention programs such as universal blood lead level testing and lead paint remediation efforts for years. Other Bay Area counties caught wind of the lawsuit and in total, 10 Bay Area counties as well as the cities of Oakland and San Diego joined the lawsuit against Sherwin-Williams, National Lead Industries, and Conagra. The hearings did not actually begin for another 13 years, and finally, in 2014, a court ruled in favor of the counties and ordered the paint companies to pay nearly $1.15 billion. However, it was a short-lived victory. Uh, the paint companies decided to appeal that to the state Supreme Court. Um, first it went to the appellate court, uh, 
and then it went to the state Supreme Court, and then finally it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. In 2019, four years later, after several rounds of appeal, that sum was cut to $305 million, a fraction of the original settlement. Because the, uh, the court order that came out in 2014, uh, the $1.1 billion um, order, it goes through the whole history of how the paint companies, when their employees were becoming sick and even dying, continued to make the product. Uh, and at one point in time, the industry was even trying to blame people of color, uh, people with low income, for not maintaining their homes and, and holding them responsible for the lead poisoning. At the end, Santa Clara City Council's office stated in a press release that the deal ends the threat of further litigation. In other words, it'd be easier to settle for less and close off the issue by collecting the money. This money would allow property owners to apply for grants and utilize the money in repair efforts such as painting over harmful lead paint or necessary maintenance associated with stripping the lead paint altogether. Even then, there were several challenges. Privilege, but it's very obvious that the paint companies are not going to make this easy. I mean. They haven't made it easy in almost 20 years of us fighting them all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. So they're not about to make it easy now. And my speculation on why is not only because, you know, $1.1 billion in 2014 was a lot of money. So they don't want to just give it to us, but the court is ordering them to. But even more importantly, there's a caveat that comes with that money. The judge ordered that the paint companies put that money into a fund from which we can draw to do lead paint remediation work. And the way the process works is we would alert property owners that this fund is available and that they can apply for grants in order to then hire contractors who have been trained in lead safety to address their friction points. But we only have four years to spend the money. That's the judge's order. And if we don't spend all the money in four years, the paint companies get the money back. The paint companies are coming up with ways to make it more likely that we will not spend the money in four years and they can get the money back. And what I mean by that is the paint companies have already indicated that they might sue property owners for applying for our grant funds, making the argument that that they're not maintaining their property and so by taking this money away from the paint companies they're not being responsible. Other states in the union are looking at California and saying you did something that we want to do and so the paint companies have to send a message that it's not going to be easy. Look at what we're putting California through and if you try to sue us we're going to do the same thing to you. While the legal disputes were going on, lead particles were still damaging the Fruitvale neighborhood. The known effects of lead poisoning are incredibly serious, such as developmental delay, physical pain, and neurological changes. However, chief among them is brain damage done to young children exposed to lead. Lead paint chips around friction areas, such as doors and window frames, and the dust settles onto the floor where kids crawl or onto toys and other household appliances. Once ingested, Lead mimics the function of calcium and damages the nervous system. When calcium enters a cell, it induces the release of a neurotransmitter to release information to the next neuron. That's how the brain communicates. Lead disrupts the movement and storage of calcium within cells, which can lead to cell death and fundamentally change how these neurotransmitters are passed. When lead is present, less calcium can enter the cell. Less calcium means the neuron releases less neurotransmitters, meaning the signal between cells weakens. Without a strong enough signal, brain function deteriorates, and in children where brain development is rapid, this poses a huge issue. When in time, they thought that it was just something that was just going to temporarily affect the child's development, that they might have a, a learning disability that they would overcome. But over time, they began to realize that uh, there were lasting effects depending upon how much uh, exposure the uh, child had, and that it could affect uh, not only brain development, but it could actually impact the, the organs and the bone structure. It could impact their behavior for their entire lives. 
Treatment for lead poisoning includes putting patients on a nutritional program high in iron, calcium, or vitamin C in an effort to draw out the lead, or in even more severe cases, prescribing strong medication which may carry heavy side effects. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention uses a blood lead reference level of 5 micrograms per deciliter to identify children with blood lead levels higher than most others. But the reality is, there is no safe level of lead for children. Any amount of lead in the blood is considered unhealthy. In a 2012 Alameda County Department of Public Health study, officials found that almost 8% of children living in Fruitville had a blood lead level of 4.5 micrograms per deciliter. In seven Oakland zip codes, toddlers were testing for elevated blood lead levels at twice or more the rate of residents in Flint, Michigan. Michael Moscarinas is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and author of two books related to environmental injustices. His research focuses on post-colonial and developmental studies, environmental justice and racism, and critical race theory. If you have lead in the house, you know, you can't, you can't cook, you can't wash. The lead has destroyed the infrastructure of the house. On the one hand, you could say, well, you're poisoning people. But what lead does is it dispossesses neighborhoods, it dispossesses families. There's all of these sorts of impacts from the lead that, that have intersecting consequences, right? So if you lose your house, you have to move. If you move, you have to take your children. Your children have to find new peer groups. You know, It's all of these intersecting ways in which uh, the lead is impacting this, the, these communities. A scientific theory called the lead crime hypothesis explains that high levels of lead are directly proportional to elevated levels of crime, which contributes strongly to the school to prison pipeline. Research to support this claim has found a connection between lead exposure and the development of learning disabilities, lower IQ scores, ADHD, and impulsive control issues. The effects of lead paint have been known since the Industrial Revolution, but it wasn't banned in the United States until 1978. If a house was built before then, there's a good chance that the walls are painted with lead paint. According to census data, hundreds of thousands of homes in the Bay Area predate the regulations of lead paint, meaning children, especially in low-income housing areas, are susceptible to exposure. Eleven states, in particularly high-risk areas, already have universal blood lead testing screenings. Iowa, their school district requires that all children be blood lead tested, I believe, at kindergarten, because they want to try to catch it early and then go out there and correct the hazards. But our state doesn't do that. Acknowledging such risks, California Assembly members Bill Quirk and Christina Garcia introduced Assembly Bill 1316, which intended to, quote, revise regulations for when doctors test children's blood for lead exposure, including more statewide universal blood lead testing standards for children. However, Bill 1316 initially failed to pass due to pushback from medical professionals and insurance companies, who claimed that implementing such standard in California would be a waste of material, time, and money. Okay, we won't go statewide because there's a lot of objection to that, but how about a universal blood lead testing bill for certain geographic areas, such as Oakland, Fruitvale, where we know historically, based on research, based on data, that they have high child lead poisoning rates, that they have high concentrations of aging housing, that they have many low-income populations that are renting, and therefore they don't have the authority to do the lead paint remediation work. Let's do testing in that way. Guidelines in place prior to Bill 1316 required all children under Medi-Cal, California's branch of Medicaid, or kids who have spent the majority of their life in houses built before 1978 to be tested. However, a report by the Environmental Working Group in 2013 found that 1.4 million 1-2 to two year olds under Medi-Cal, or about 34% who are at risk for lead poisoning, were not being adequately tested. In more affluent counties such as Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, or Sacramento, 30-48% to 48 of young kids on Medi-Cal were not being tested. In more than 16 low-income counties, between 57 to 87 percent of kids were not being tested. That if kids that are mandated to be tested aren't being tested, then what happens to the kids whose families aren't on government-assisted programs, but you know maybe they don't have any medical coverage, or they have medical coverage, but their medical providers aren't giving them the test. So we've got a huge gap in terms of knowing how many children really are lead poisoned. So when, when I look at, you know, the child lead poisoning rates by zip code and I see 
94601, more than, you know, 7% of children tested, I'm saying, okay, that's 7% of children tested, but we're talking thousands of children who never got tested. So it's, it's much worse. I'm saying it's much, much worse than what we really know. Following this report, in the fall of 2017, Bill 1316 passed unanimously and mandated reform on the lead testing program. And in September of 2020, Gavin Newsom signed into law Bill AB2276, which reformed the system to hold people accountable for adequate blood lead testing. And there's more to this story. A new round of water testing began today in the Oakland Unified School District. East Bay Mud is doing a series of tests to root out lead contamination due to older fixtures on some campuses. The school districts have had some problems with some of their water fountains having uh, lead in the uh, taps. The issue came to light after district staff discovered unacceptable levels of lead at McClyman's High School. So we went out and tested the water there, found that there were some issues in the showers, in the kitchen, and in a couple of water fountains across campus. John Sasaki has been the Director of Communications at the Oakland Unified School District since 2016. Well, I, I do know that historically the city of Oakland has been very proactive in mitigating the issues of lead-based paint. That Oakland did go through and, and mitigate a great deal of the lead-based paint that exists in, in, throughout the city. Certainly the high lead levels in, in Fruitville, uh, so they're pretty well known in Oakland. We've been concerned hearing about it. The health and well-being of our students is, is paramount here. When you're in an environment where it's maybe on the ground, dirt perhaps, paint that's chipped off the house, kids are like young and crawling through it, that can be very problematic. But anytime we, we encounter a student, a family that has concerns, uh, we make sure that they are connected to the right medical professionals. We have some clinics in our schools that they can go to uh, if they don't have insurance. The good thing about the county is they will actually go to people's homes and investigate and make sure that there is no lead threat. And, and if there is, that they'll help uh, the family figure out how to mitigate that issue. Coffrey J is an artist, activist, speaker, and founder of Hip Hop for Change, a 503c nonprofit organization based in Oakland. Hip Hop for Change advocates for grassroots activism and educates people about socioeconomic injustices and how to combat them. I mean, I, I'd like to give the Oakland Unified School District a little bit of props for going and, and testing their schools. Uh, they're, they're doing a good job with that. I still think it could be done, it could be be more intensive. It could be like they literally haven't tested every faucet. Um, and I think that Oakland and Unified is doing better than a lot of uh, Unified school districts are doing when they face issues of lead. But still, personally, I want every single faucet that a child's lips are going to you know, touch to be tested. It's that important because there's not a safe level of lead in the bloodstream. In May of 2019, the Oakland Unified School District and the East Bay Municipal Utility District completed water tests on water fountains, water dispensers, and taps within their school district, identifying which appliances were tainted with lead and required maintenance. Within the 203-page report, 103 appliances were identified as having high levels of lead and needing repair, and maintenance is currently in progress. While progress is being made statewide and within the Oakland School District, the issue of lead poisoning is not unique to Oakland or Flint, Michigan. The Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism published a study in 2016 revealing that nearly 3,000 communities across the U.S. had worse lead poisoning crises than Flint, Michigan. Take a look at these pictures of communities facing child lead poisoning crises across the United States. Most areas are concentrated in urban cities while others are out in the countryside. Take these maps and let's compare them to the racial demographics of each city. There are undeniable correlations between the two. This pattern is repeated everywhere. They're living in these toxic, toxic environments from the beginning. And you have a racist sort of system of government that, that has created ghettos, segregated residential areas, right? Either through gerrymandering or through redlining. So what you see is a real disproportionate re response after the water crisis. You in particular, poor people are disproportionately impacted, in part because of what they do, 
in the capital system, right? A lot of them are work in heavy industry, in jobs that expose them to toxic chemicals every day. In a way in which a white suburb person or a white collar person is not exposed in the same way. We can look at hazardous waste sites over the last four decades. The leading indicator of where a hazardous waste site will be located in this country is race. Race is the predictor of where a toxic waste site will be located. It's people of color who live in these neighborhoods and industry actually comes in after them. There's not a lot of longitudinal studies that are done actually, but those, particularly the ones that we've done in Paul Mohai University of Michigan, pretty much show that pattern. Many Fruitvale residents are low-income tenants, meaning they have no control over the maintenance of the homes and lack financial resources to take action themselves. The lead crisis among minority communities can be largely attributed to the housing crisis. Increasingly expensive housing costs force lower-income families into more affordable and in turn older houses, which may contain the lead paint. Even accessing resources such as doctor's appointments and nutritional programs can be difficult. There is a significant number of single family, duplexes, fourplexes on up um, that are pre-1978 buildings that should be inspected on a regular basis and they're not. There are other states um, and cities where they do routine rental inspections. So they go out ahead of the, uh, a time and they look at rental units and they check for lead hazards. Um, sometimes it's a before people move in, sometimes it's because they're already living there and they want to identify the hazards and get them corrected before children are lead poisoned. You know, again, we don't have mandatory uh, routine rental inspections here in, uh, in Oakland. At the federal level, there's no funds probably available. There's no initiative. You may have the EPA, but what Bush and what Trump is doing is they starve these agencies, so they can't do, the, can't fulfill their mandates in any meaningful way. Local environmental coalitions, right? So the state government is much more active and invested in the county as well. In terms of getting government agencies interested, that would be where I would start. Why are they not more proactive? That's a good question. I believe actually we needed to have more money because we should be addressing all hazards, both inside and out. I also think that we need more money because the thing is, the current solution to addressing most lead hazards is to remediate, paint over the existing paint because it would be too expensive to strip all the buildings down to the bare wood and paint them all over again. So you have to do this constant maintenance effort, effort where you're looking at the paint um, and observing if it's chipping and then painting over it. And that's gonna be something that has to be done as long as these houses exist. I know the, the community, the organizations that are supposed to be testing for lead in Oakland, they're underfunded and they're understaffed, right? Let's make some new jobs testing homes, right? Um, let's create that workforce to clean up. I, I think that's the biggest thing. We need to invest in our people. We need to invest in our infrastructure. We need to invest in fixing this stuff. Let's get people back to work and let's get people back to work fixing and repairing marginalized communities first.